We're going to go over Andre Karpathy's uh, review of Llama 3. Then we're going to uh, react to Drakesh Patel's interview of Mark Zuckerberg. This is Fic Podcast. We talk about business, AI, and comedy. We're hosted by two former Googlers. My colleague, Joe Zernanski, is going out buying a Hawaiian island. I'm here at the back of a Wendy's. If you like uh, D-minus comedy and good takes on AI and business without the hype, hit that like and subscribe. So, Llama 3 came out today and... And so that's how I'm feeling. So let's go over to see. Um, I was doing all this reading and research on the Facebook blog post and trying to summarize the, the, the juicy bits. And I was like, maybe I should see what Andre's doing. And then Andre did it all for me. And I'm like, God damn it. God bless him. You should follow Andre Karpathy. It just goes out saying probably one of the best minds in AI. So Andre says, notes on the Llama 3 launch, releasing an 8 billion, 70 billion parameter model, both base and fine-tuned, strong performing in their model class, but we'll see when the rankings come in. So this is the hugging face chatbot arena. So you're going to hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, my model, it rated high on a data set trained on your grandmother, and uh, it really kicks ass. And if you squint, it beats GPT-4 and 5. And then Google comes out and is like, well, I train a different data set on your grandmother, and it's far better than your model. Haha, <laughs> good day, sir. And they take off their monocle and whatnot. That's all malarkey. So instead, you go to Chatbot Arena, and then you have t you get two chat completions from a random model. You don't know where the model's from. And then you vote which one is good or not, which one's the best. And then uh, by all the votes, people then just basically pick which one's superior. So if you go to the current leaderboard right now, okay. I have to accept everything. GPT-4 Turbo is back in command. Claude 3 Opus did dethrone it for a second. But yeah, that's what y'all should look at when it comes to which models are the best or whatnot. They're also training a 400 billion parameter model, but already encroaching GPT-4 territory. Uh, E.g. 84.8 MLU versus 86.5 for Turbo. So they're at 400 billion parameters, and I think... Someone can quote, actually, I can just look. GPT-4 parameter count is 1.7 trillion. Yeah, 1.75 trillion. So if they are already at 400 billion parameters and they're getting close to what GPT-4 Turbo is, that's super, that's super duper awesome. So tokenizer, the number of tokens was 4X from 32K to 128K. With more tokens, you can compress, sequence more in length, size 15% fewer tokens, and seize better downstream performance. Architecture, no major differences from Llama 2. In Llama 2, only the bigger models use group query attention, but now all models do, including the smallest 8 billion model. This is a parameter sharing scheme for the keys and values of the tension, which reduces the size of the KV cache during inference. This is good. Welcome. Complexity reducing fix and optimization. Sequence length, the maximum number of tokens in the context when it was bumped from 8,000, 8,192 from 4,096 in Llama 2 in 2048 this bump is welcomed but quite small modern standards and i think many people were hoping for more on this access maybe around gpt4 which is 128k tokens which equates to like 90,000 words or so so maybe they can make this improvement down the road with fine tuning i know joe was showing papers where you could there's ways that you can get models that are already trained and you can use different technique to extend their context window without having to go through the whole training process. Um, training data, Llama 2 is trained on 2 trillion tokens. Llama 3 was bumped to 15 trillion training data set, including a lot of attention that went to quality 4x more code tokens and, and 5x non-n tokens over 30 languages. 5% uh, is fairly low, non-n mix, so certainly this is mostly English model, but it's quite nice. So... What we mean, what we've been seeing the research is if you train the models on code, it improves their reasoning ability because there's something in the structure of code that allows them to easily understand logic. And I think the way that, you know, code is written with if then statements and very clear this is a variable and this is what the code should do to, fu to execute translates well to when it comes to reasoning or reading statements and trying to prove if something is true or not. Scaling laws, very notably 15 trillion is a very, very large data set to train with for a model as small as 8 billion parameters. And this is not normally done and is new and very welcome. The chinchilla compute optimal point for an 8 billion model would train, train it for 200 billion tokens. If you were only interested to get the most bang for the buck, 
okay, it keeps on saying W R R R T. Okay, there we go. With respect to model performance at that size. So this is training at 75x beyond that point, which is unusual, but personally I think extremely welcome. Because we all get a very capable model that is very small, easy to work with, and inference. Meta mentions that even at this point, the model doesn't seem to be converging in standard sense. In other words, the LLMs we work with all the time are significantly under-trained by a factor of maybe 100 to 1,000 extra more, nowhere near their, po their point of convergence. Actually, I really hope people carry forward the trend and start training and releasing even more long-trained, even smaller models. So this would tie to what he was mentioning up here, is their 400 billion parameter model is still training, but it's approaching GPT-4 territory because it's training on so many so many more tokens um, than what GPT-4, I guess, was it was was originally trading on, but please go ahead and correct me in the comment section because I only work at a Wendy's. Uh, systems, Llama 3 is side as trained with 16K GPUs observed throughout a 400 uh, teraflops. It is not mentioned, but I'm assuming these are H100s at FPF 16, which clock at 1,970 teraflops in NVIDIA marketing materials. But we all know their tiny asterisks with sparsity is doing a lot of work and really you want to divide the number by two to get the real teraflops of approximately 990. Why is it sparsely counting as flops? Anyways, focus on Dre. So 400 divided by 990 is 40% utilization, not too bad at all across that many GPUs. A lot of really solid engineering is required to get here at that scale. Too long didn't read, super welcome. Llama 3 is a very capable looking model released uh, for Meta, sticking to fundamentals, spending a lot of quality time on solid systems and data work, exploring the limits of long training models. Also very excited for the 400 billion, mo 400 billion parameter model, which could be the first GPT-4 grade open source release. I think many people will ask for more context length. Personal ask, I think I'm not alone to say I also love much smaller models than 8 billion for educational work and for unit testing, and maybe for embedding applications, ideally 100 uh, approximately 100 million and 101 billion uh, scale. Okay, so that's great. Um, then we got Matt Schumer saying the craziest Llama 3 reveal, the 400 billion version of the model is on par with Claude 3 Opus and is still training. Soon we'll have a better than Opus fully open source model. The implications are huge. So, and then we have our friend Soli again. So Llama 3 beats both Sonnet and Gemini Pro 1.5. This is actually huge. Open source models are back. Okay, so community seems very happy with this. Speaking of happy communities, uh, we were talking a little bit about this um, in our community. So I tend to post news that I'm going to react to here first so I can get questions from folks. And um, Offs mentions that uh, sounds like it's going to be a bit of a challenge for the community to tune it, even they do eventually open source it. That's going to need some beefy compute to even run. And original Llama 2 was pretty iffy. It was really it was really the community's remixes that made it usable. But we'll see, I suppose. Sounds like it's not quite as nerfed as the original, which would refuse almost as often as Claude 2.1. Every time you ask for something rude, an AI ethicist gets vapors. <laughs> so I'm going to give him real quick a, uh, a Sam flirt. So this is our private Discord community. You have to be a, a supporter on YouTube or Patreon, any tier to get access to this. We do this so we can ensure we get the best folks in here who are super passionate about um, business, AI, tech. Uh, they, love, they love comedy and investing and things like that. And this also makes sure we have to deal with bots too, which is very nice. So we talk about various things from AI to we do like funny funny memes and things like that and so people are saying hey if they don't do this for oj's procession the funeral home that's a missed opportunity and that's the oj simpson his his low speed chase uh after after his the crime that he committed in which allegedly but no he's totally guilty um so we have that we have gaming entertainment we have investing channels we're talking about like private equity also the saudi arabia it looks like this thing they're trying to build, this like linear city is just going to be a complete malarkey. Then we do research. Um, uh, Offs posted something about the state of AI in 13 charts. And then I um, posted, I had, a, I had a post in here about um, how cities are built and whatnot. Um, and I thought that was really, uh, it was a really interesting research paper. So anyways, um, hit that join button and, or support us on Patreon. And if you are already supporting us, on either platform. Thank you, and come join us here in the community. It's 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 great. Okay, so let's go to the Zuckerberg interview. This is Mark Zuckerberg being interviewed by uh, Prakesh, and he's talking about Llama 3 features. Bottom line on this is that 
With Llama 3, we now think that Meta AI is the most intelligent AI assistant that people can use that's freely available. Um, we're also integrating Google and Bing for real-time knowledge. Um, we're going to make it a lot more prominent across our apps. So, you know, basically, you know, at the top of WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook and Messenger, uh, you'll just be able to um, you know, use the search box right there to ask, ask any question. Um, and there's a bunch of new creation features that we, that we added that I think are pretty cool that I think people enjoy. Uh, and I think animations is, is a good one. Um, you can basically just take any image and animate it. But I think one that, that, uh, people are gonna find pretty wild is, uh, it now generates high quality images so quickly. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to play with this, that it actually generates it as you're typing and updates it in real time. So you're like typing your query and it's, and it's kind of like honing in on, and, and, you know, it's like, okay, here, um, you know, show me a picture of a, a cow. Okay. Yeah. I have access to the image generator, got access to that early and it's just super great. Like I can make funny images all the time. I'm always trying to press it to make inappropriate, funny question, uh, images for one of my WhatsApp groups. And, uh, it, it, it does deliver sometimes. Uh, it, it's really cool. I'm just excited to see a company that has this amount of reach and they're just infusing AI into the product and letting you touch it anywhere you go. And I think it's going to benefit everyone on um, his platform. This next question, uh, what is he releasing today? Roadmap of new releases and, and, and beyond. Three versions, um, you know, an 8 billion and a 70 billion, which we're releasing today and a 405 billion dense model, um, which is still training. So, so we're not releasing that today. Um, but you know, the eight and 70, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty excited about how they turned out. I mean, it's, um, you know, they're, they're leading for, for their scale. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll release a blog post with all the benchmarks so people can check it out themselves. And obviously it's open source so people get a chance to play with it. Um, we have a roadmap of new releases coming. Uh, that are going to bring multimodality, more multilinguality, um, bigger context windows to those as well. Um, and then, you know, hopefully sometime later in the year, we'll, we'll get to roll out the 405, which I think is, is um, you know, in training, it's still training. But uh, for, for where it is right now in training, it is already at um, around 85 mm three versions. So that's, he's talking about what uh, Andre Karpathy alluded to, that this thing is the 400 billion model, 400 billion parameter model is already on par with GPT-4, which is fantastic for the open source community. Also just mentioning how um, they're training these models and they're going to be releasing possibly four and five later this year. So they are going all in on this, which is just fantastic for everyone, which I think is really great. Let's go to the next clip. Let's see here. This is on putting size in context. And as, the 8 billion is, um, is nearly as as powerful as the biggest version of llama 2 that we released so it's mm. like the smallest llama 3 is basically as powerful as the and what's important about this is they want to continue to mini miniaturize these models that they can so they can get something eventually on you know people's mobile devices and if you can run compute locally it makes things much better i think one thing we saw recently um that humane pin launch since it was getting beaten down by everyone on the internet i'm just like hey you know they tried something. Some people made some comments that the, I guess the CEO or whatnot is kind of arrogant. I wasn't paying attention to any of that, but that, 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 that stinks that the CEO was, but either way, they are trying something new, which is good. But when I've been watching the reviews, the issue they, they, they run into is they're not really, they're, the, their model's not running locally on that pin. Every time you ask it a question, it goes up into, goes, it goes up into the cell phone tower, goes to some server, server is where the model's running, computes it, goes back to the cell phone tower into your machine. That causes a long, awkward delay. Now, if you had a miniaturized model, it could be inside the pin and you could get in instantaneous um, responses, which you want, because um, we want real-time uh, ability to ask these models questions without having to stop and wait for them to answer questions. Now, of course, the question is like, what's the meaning of life? Yeah, I'll let the model compute that for a couple hours or a year or, or weeks or whatnot. But I have a question of like, what's the nearest place I can lose some pizza right now? I want to answer lickety split. Okay, this is the next one on um, question uh, to sell. Okay, so this is when Mark was deciding, should I sell Facebook or not? Like, I think the actual valuation of Facebook at the time is this, and they're not actually getting the valuation right. Like, they offered you $5 trillion. Of course you would have sold. So what, what, like, what, how, how did you think about that choice? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, I think some of these things are just personal. Um, I, I don't know at the time that I was sophisticated enough to do that analysis, mm. but I had all these people around me who were making all these arguments for how like, a billion dollars was, you know, it's like, here's the revenue that we need to make. And here's how big we need to be. And like, it's clearly so many years in the future. Like, I mean, it was, it was very far ahead of where we were at the time. And I don't know, I didn't, I didn't really, 
have the financial sophistication to really even engage with that kind of debate. I just, I think I sort of deep down believed in what we were doing. And I, I did some analysis. Um, I was like, okay, well, what would I go do if I wasn't doing this? It's like, well, I really like building things and I like helping people communicate and I like understanding what's going on with people and the dynamics between people. So I think if I sold this company, I'd just go build another company like this. And I kind of like the one I have. So, <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, what's, wh wh why, right. But um, I don't know. I, I think a lot of the biggest bets that people make um, are often just based on conviction and values. Um, not, it's, it's actually usually very hard to do the analyses trying to connect the dots forward. Yeah. So you've had, um, Facebook. So I thought that was, those are some really good points there. Um, and also it just shows how intellectually humble he is. He could have concocted some story about like, oh yeah, I looked at the quantities of this and, that, and those sort of told me what to do. Uh, a lot of time that's malarkey because we don't have perfect information and a lot of times we're making decisions based upon our values, our emotions, what we think, feel, what is right. And then later on, maybe if the, if the decision comes out true, we get someone like Walter Isaacson to write a biography about us and be like, ever since Mark Zuckerberg slid out of his mother's vagina, he realized he would turn down the billion dollar deal to sell Facebook. And so uh, I like how he brought that up. And then also explaining that you know, I have everything I want here. Why am I just going to go sell this company and then rebuild it again? And I saw that a lot in M&A. I would see people, they would sell their company and they didn't want to, but they had to do it because their investors wanted to get cashed out. And then now they have to go back and like rebuild the same company. But then they get frustrated because the new company doesn't work as well as the first company did. And they know that if they stuck with the original company, they probably could have built something that was truly remarkable. I mean, getting an exit still great, but... It's still, you, you lose your baby. Um, we were talking about in the Elliot interview that we recently did about innovation, how there's more to just than the money for what you're doing for this business. There is also, the business represents to a degree who you are and you kind of invest some of your yourself. Um, you look at it as this is, uh, the business is representing craftsmanship and artistic value that you're creating. And you shouldn't, take things personally in business, but also at the same time, people want to have impact and they also want to do something where they feel we're not just doing this for money. We're doing something for, for greater, something greater. And so I, I respected uh, Zuck's answer to that question. So let's go to the next one. This is about um, um, emotional understanding of AI models. Okay multimodality is, is kind of a key one that we're focused on now, initially with photos and images and text, but eventually with videos. And then because we're so focused on the metaverse, kind of 3D type stuff is important. Um, one modality that I'm pretty focused on that I haven't seen as many other people in the industry um, focus on this is sort of like emotional understanding. Like, I mean, uh, so much of, of the human brain is just dedicated to understanding people and, and kind of like understanding your expressions and emotions. And I think that that's like its own whole modality, right? That, um, I mean, you could say, okay, maybe it's just video or image, but it's like clearly a very specialized version of those two. So there's all these different capabilities that I think you want to basically train the models to focus on. Is well Also, I love that since Zuck got his swag back. He, he got his swagger back once he fired Cheryl, Cheryl San, Sandberg. Um, he now grows his hair out and he wears extra, extra large rapper, all black t-shirts. Like he's one of the, he's like the rapper in the background dancing while the music's playing or whatnot, or he's a bouncer. Um, I enjoyed that point And I, I look at people really like the dog on emotions recently the last 10, 15 years has been like Zen this, stoicism this, and blah, 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 blah. but there's gotta be value uh, for us to be able to recognize our emotions. Um, emotions can lead to great insight. Emotions can also help us get out of a rut. Emotions can um, take us to extreme highs and extreme lows and it can actually lead to better artistic creativity. Uh, emotions can make us feel alive. And I think that's part of the, the, the central human experience and I'm really happy that he brought that up. I know I'm not going to go woo woo like Kabbalah of AI crap, but he, as humans, we're, we're less humans. We are very good. Something like Lex Freeman there. Humans. We are very good at when we make decisions, 
trying to cover up emotionally based decisions. And we even do this in our politics too. And we try to play like this David Sachs, rational actor, what's in your self-interest? Nations only act other self-interest. And that's another reason why you need to, you don't see me talking about like quantum computing and crap like that. Cause it's not my lane. But when David Sachs talks about politics, like he knows so much, he didn't get, ed- he never got an education in politics. And one of the first things you learn in politics is like rational actor is just one model of looking at the world. There is economic models. There is historic. There is looking at historical model of country. There's cultural decisions make, made in politics. There is also emotional decisions made by leaders, and so all these things come together, which leads to a country's foreign policy. And I think making it so these models can understand human emotion and how we think will allow models to have engage with humans in a better way and truly understand us, and also be able to. You know, help people when they're going through emotional trauma to recognize what's going on instead of responding like a robot and being like, the way you're thinking this way is due to neurons in your brain and blah, blah, blah. No, realizing that, yes, this might be a subjective experience to the person, but it is a real experience that's objectively hurting them. And this robot, this now this AI understands emotions, it can tap into that and help that person get across this, this uh, emotional state. So I think it was really uh, interest- nice that you brought that up. So... Let's go to the next video here where he talks about AI will change Facebook products. I mean, our bet is that it's going to, this is basically going to change all of the products, right? So I think that there's going to be a kind of meta AI general assistant product. And I think that that will shift from something that feels more like a chat bot where it's like, you just ask a question and it kind of formulates an answer to things where you're increasingly giving it more complicated tasks and that goes away and does them. Mm. So I think that's going to, take a lot of inference. It's going to take a lot of compute in other ways too. Um, then I think that there's a big part of what we're going to do that is um, like interacting with other agents for other people. So whether it's businesses or creators, um, I guess a big part of my theory on this is that there's not just going to be like one singular AI that you interact with because I think um, you know every business is going to like want an AI that represents their interests. They're not going to like want to primarily interact with you through an AI that is going to sell their competitors' customers. So, uh, sorry, their competitors' products. Um, uh, good points again. That's why I think this whole sovereign AI lunacy that Yamad's talking about, each nation has one great AI and the nation, the AI knows all and blah, blah, is garbage. I think it's going to be more of city states. You just have multiple different types of AIs or different tasks that are going to be really uh, fluent in certain domains. Um, and I think it's going to be a great experience. I also like how he brings up, uh, you know, Zuckerberg, I think Zuckerberg, if I had a bet between Who's going to hit that holy grail of that everything app that Elon's looking for? I think Zuckerberg's probably going to hit it first with WhatsApp. And one component is, is that the way people interact with WhatsApp and his other products is definitely different than Twitter. You go to Twitter just to talk crap to people, get into political piss fest, um, suck Elon's crank, uh, talk about how AI is going to take over the world, and then that's about it. Whereas when most people are on WhatsApp, they have small groups, they're friends, or they might be talking crap in one group. But another group, they're thinking about what movies to go to, or another group, they're thinking about what to buy, or another group, thinking about organizing events and things like that. And having one of these models pop up and do that organizational tasks for you. Like, like one thing you could do right now is how many of you have tried to organize events for your friends and you spend most of your time acting like a taskmaster, just trying to say, Have you RSCP'd? Did you RSCP yet? What's going on? Having an AI that you could tag in for WhatsApp community and be like, hey, we're trying to organize a barbecue. Can you make sure everyone RSVPs this and just stay on people until they say yes or no or something? Like, that's a win. Or, hey, we're thinking about uh, going to uh, Madrid. Can you uh, think of some t- things that we could do for us three? Uh, here's our backgrounds. Find things that would uh, uh, that work well with our hobbies, like going outdoor- outdoors and backpacking like every other yuppie here in the Bay Area. Like, let us know what you can find. I think that's going to be powerful. Or we're trying to do uh, birthday shopping for a friend. You can go on the internet and look for certain items in these different dimensions. Hey, so I think this. I think he's spot on about that. Um, so let's go to the the next one here. Okay. On our platforms, they all basically have the pattern where um, they want to engage their community, but they're limited by hours in the day, and their community generally wants to engage them, but they don't have. They're limited by hours in the day. Um, so if you could create something where. Um, an AI could basically, where that creator can basically own the AI and train it in the way that they want um, and can engage their community. I think that that's going to be super powerful too. So, um, so I think that there's going to be a ton of engagement across all these things. Um, but these are just the consumer use cases. I mean, I think when you think about stuff like, I mean, you know, I run like 
our foundation, right? A Chan Zuckerberg initiative with my wife and, you know, we're doing a bunch of stuff on science and, um, and there's obviously a lot of AI work that where, that I think is going to advance science and healthcare and all these things too. So I think that it's like, there's a, this is, I think going to end up affecting basically every area of the products and, and, and the, and the, uh, the economy. The thing you mentioned about, I realized we need a nickname for Zuckerberg, but it's a, a nickname because he's a bro. Like, and with that big gangster rap, black tee he's wearing like, it's like little zucky or little zz little z little zz or something what we'll to, we'll to work on it let me know in the comment section it's our respect we give people give people nicknames you respect too we also have nicknames people we don't respect we won't go into that later um what's interesting about his views on ai and how they actually mirror billy gates is because they both have foundations and I think him and Billy Gates go to developing countries and just see how bad things are and if we had a little bit more of just resources or information or in intelligence in the form of some type of AI related nurse or doctor that could answer little questions for people like, no, you shouldn't go to a witch doctor to cure this problem. You should actually take a Tylenol or something. They see the potential there. And so I think that's what keeps them rooted in reality. So then when they fly back here in America and they listen to uh, Yud or deranged Jesus with a dirty Sanchez mustache, talk about how this is going to destroy society. They're just like, Bro, these things hallucinate all the time and can't remember squat. Like, time out. Instead, let's just focus on there are people in different countries who are suffering and these models could improve. So let's focus on that. Okay, you could do your whole Skynet fantasy somewhere else, but I'm trying to save lives. So I think that's why Zuckerberg is just really grounded in reality. I also think these AI tools are wonderful for creators right now. When I was working at Salesforce, I could not use most of these AI tools because we're blocked by either uh, legal, privacy, policy teams, security eng, HR policy teams, and whatnot. But then once I left, now I can use all these different AI tools. I'm thinking about doing AI tool product reviews that have been helpful for being a creator here on YouTube. And I think that's a golden age right now for creativity, being able to use these tools. And it just it shows tremendous amounts of impact. So I'm glad he saw that the, the creator use case is great for these AI tools. It's just the enterprise use case is a little bit harder because of all the different requirements that they have in the program world. I also see these tools being more adopted by small businesses because they're, they don't have all the uh, com uh, compliance hoops of these larger, larger enterprises to have. Okay, so let's go to this next one. This is how models progress. How do, like, what does the progression look like? Is it scaling? Is it just same size, but different banks like you were talking about? Um, I, I don't know that we know the answer to that. So I think one thing that is seems to be a pattern is that you have the llama, uh, sorry, the, the, the llama model, and then you build some kind of other application specific code around it, right? So some of it is is the fine tuning for the use case, but some of it is just like logic for, okay, how um, like how meta AI should integrate, like it should work with tools like Google or Bing to bring in real time knowledge. I mean, that's not part of the base llama model. That's like part of it. Okay, so for llama two, we had some of that and it was a little more kind of hand engineered. And then part of our goal for llama three was to bring more of that into the model itself. And, but for Llama 3, as we start getting into more of these agent-like behaviors, I think some of that is going to be more hand-engineered. And then I think our goal for Llama 4 will be to bring more of that into the model. So I think at each point, uh, like at each step along the way, you kind of have a sense of what's going to be possible on the horizon. You start messing with it and hacking around it. Um, and then I think that that helps you hone your intuition for what you want to try to ch train into the next version of the model itself. Interesting. Which makes it more general, because obviously anything that you're hand-coding is... Um, you know, you can unlock some use cases, but it's just inherently brittle and non-general. Mm. Hey, so this ties to our recent video that we did, Google's React to Sam Altman's uh, new interview, which AI companies does he think will be crushed? And so one concept that I think is really important just between any, just any discipline, regardless of it is like STEM or, or business or political science or whatnot, when you start, getting information from different sources that come to the same conclusion, you then get to start triangulating and say, okay, there's something real here. And one common thing that we're hearing over and over again is these models are going to improve and they're going to be getting um, startups that have built their company based on little uh, discrepancies in these models to improve things like this is a better way of doing rag or this allows you to extend the context window of the model so it can now instead of looking at a 10 pdf 10 page pdf document it can look out the whole entire uh uh the national reserves and or the washington the national archive 
those will get crushed by these models as they get better. And so he was making a point also, if you build the scaffolding, eventually it becomes your own prison because the model doesn't need the scaffolding anymore and you're actually slowing the model down. So he sees that, which is which I find find interesting. So let's go to let's go back to the video. Um, this is Prakash talking about this company called um, Command Prompt or something. Command bar. Yeah, there you go. Give them some some uh, some t air time right there for a second. Okay, let's go back to the video. The tool use was very very specific. Um, whereas Llama three has the ability to has much better tool use, right? So so we don't have to like hand code all the stuff to have it use Google to to go do a search. Um, it just kind of can do that. Um, so. And similarly for coding and and kind of running code and just a, a bunch of stuff like that and um, but I think once you kind of get that capability, then you get a peek of okay, well, what can we start doing next? Okay, well, I don't necessarily want to wait until Llama four is around to start building those capabilities. So let's start hacking around it. And mm. um, so you do you do a bunch of hand coding and that makes the um, the products better if for the interim. But then that also helps show the way of what we want to try to build into the next version of the model. What I was thinking about his rap name, maybe Marky B could possibly work. So let me know what you think about that. Okay, let's go to, um, okay, let's go to this real quick. Oh, so me and Joe recorded on Patreon a video, when will Google uh, vids be killed and why Ukrainian army prefers Chinese drones over finicky US drones. So you can get a two minute preview of it for free. If you want to see the whole entire thing, go to patreon.com forward slash fic um, and, or become a supporter on patreon.com forward slash fic or become a supporter here on our channel. It's the um, the supporter tier for four ninety nine, and you also get access to our Discord. And we have about uh, twenty six other videos here, a lot of great content. Um, so we get full episodes here for people who support the channel, either through YouTube or Patreon, um, under the supporter tier. So it's a really great value. Plus, you also get access to our newsletter, our Discord, our reading list, um, and everything else. So let's go to the next thing. Here in clip 10, he's talking about um, regulations and AI bottlenecks. Heavily regulated. It's just. Government function, right? So you're going from, on the one hand, software, which is somewhat regulated. I, I'd, I'd argue that it is more regulated than I think a lot of people in the, in, the, in the tech community feel, although it's obviously different. If you're starting a small company, maybe you feel that less. If you're a big company, you know, we just interact with people, uh, different governments and regulators are, you know, we have kind of lots of rules or, yeah. or, that we need to. That's very, very polite way of saying the government's in my crap 24-7 and I don't like it. Kind of follow and make sure we do a good job with around the world. Um, but I think that there's no doubt that like energy, and if you're talking about building large new power plants or large build outs and then building transmission lines that cross other private or public land, that is just a heavily regulated thing. So you're talking about many years of lead time. So if we wanted to stand up just some like massive facility um, to power that, I think that that is that's that's a very long term project, right? And um, so I don't know. I, I think that that's I, I think people do it, I don't, but but I don't think that this is like something that can be quite as magical as just like okay, you get a level of AI and you get a bunch of capital and you put it in, and then like all of a sudden the models are just gonna kind of like it just it, like I think you you do hit different bottlenecks along the way. Yeah. So that's his argument against Kook Squad. Kook Squad saying, "Oh, we're so close to AGI, and then it's just it's up and to the right, and it's over, and we're in Alpha Centauri, and we're not working anymore." Woo! And, and Marky Marky Z's like, "No, that's just not how it works." And he's explaining the regulatory system of how hard it's just to get power online. So it's interesting in California. Um, a lot of people had their environmental purity rings on. We're saying, "Hey, we need to get rid of Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant." And at the same time, we need to stop using natural gas. And also at the same time, we need more electric cars. And all the people I knew who work in just electricity or, or work PGD or whatnot are like, ah, oh, where are we going to get surplus energy? Uh, the, the solar, we don't have solar yet, or, and the wind's not consistent. We need, we need more power. And so they eventually kept Diablo Canyon open because the governor realized, yeah, if we shut this thing down, we're going to have brownouts in Silicon Valley. You know, the, the, the tech capital of the world already has terrible internet and now is having brownouts. Yikes. So um, one ball in that cure is just, it was GPUs, but the next thing now is electricity and then getting permits for building these power plants and where, you, where can you have them? And there's so, many regula so much regulation, it's very hard to do that. Uh, so you can see Mark is very contrarian and all the AI hype stuff about AGI tomorrow and all this other garbage. Okay, so 
let's go to um, is AI the most important technology ever? Scale. If you think like humans evolved uh -huh. and then like AI happened and then they like went out through the galaxy, or maybe it takes many decades, maybe it takes a century, but like, really, is that like the grand scheme of what's happening right now in history? Um, sorry, in what sense? I mean, in the sense that there are other technologies like computers and even like fire, but like it, the AI happening is as significant as like humans evolving in the first place. No, <laughs> he needs to steal my question. Mark, imagine we're playing Civilization 8 right now and we're looking back at this time period over the last 20 years of computing. What are three technologies in computing that you think would be on that tech tree? Would neural nets be on there? Would uh, G GPUs that can actually train these neural nets be on there? Would cloud computing be on there? Da, 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 da. Would the general transformer be on there? I, I think that's tricky. Um, I think people like to... I mean, the history of humanity, I think, has been people basically, you know, thinking that certain aspects of humanity are like really unique in different ways. And then coming to grips with the fact that that's not true, but humanity is actually still super special, right? So it's, um, you know, it's like, we thought that the earth was the center of the universe and it's like, it's not, but like, it's like humans are still pretty awesome, yeah. right? And, and pretty unique. Um, I think that another bias that people tend to have is thinking that intelligence is somehow kind of fundamentally connected to life. And it's not actually clear that it is, right? I, I think like, like people think that, um, I mean, I, I don't know that we have a clear enough definition of consciousness or, um, or, or, or life to kind of fully um, interrogate this, but I know there, there's all the science fiction about, okay, you create intelligence and now it like starts taking on all these human like behaviors and, and things like that. But I actually think that the current incarnation of all this stuff, at least kind of feels like it's going in a direction where intelligence can be pretty separated from consciousness and agency and things like that, that um, I think just makes it a super valuable tool. So I, I don't know. I mean, obviously it's, it's, um, it's very difficult to predict what direction this stuff goes in over time, which is why I, I don't think anyone should be dogmatic about, you know, how they plan to develop it or what they plan to do. I think you want to kind of look at like each release, you know, it's like, we're obviously very pro open source, yeah. but I haven't committed that we're going to like release every single thing that we do, mm. but it's basically we I, like I'm, I'm just generally very inclined to thinking that open sourcing it is going to be good for the community and, and also good for us right because we'll, we'll benefit from from the innovations um but if it, at some point like there's some qualitative change in what the the thing is capable of and we feel like it's just not responsible to open source it then we won't but um so i don't know it's it's, it's all it's all very difficult to predict yeah um what is a kind of qualitative change like a specific thing you're training llama 5 llama 4 and you've seen this and like we're, we're, uh, you know what i'm not sure about open sourcing it um I think that that it's a little hard to answer that in the abstract because there are negative behaviors that any product can exhibit mm -hmm. that as long as you can mitigate it, it's like, it's okay. Right. So, um, I mean, there's bad things about social media that we work to mitigate, right. There's bad things about llama two that we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that it's not like, you know, helping people commit violent acts or things like that. Right. I mean, that doesn't mean that it's like a, a kind of a autonomous or intelligent agent. It just means that it's learned a lot about the world and it can answer a set of questions that um, we think it would be unhelpful for it to answer. Um, so I, um, I don't know. I think the question isn't really what behaviors would it show? It's what things would we not be able to mitigate after it shows that? And, um, and I don't know. I, I, I think that there's so many ways in which something can be good or bad that it's hard to actually enumerate them all up front. If you even look at like what we've had to deal with in, in, um, you know, social media and like the different types of harms we've basically gotten to. It's like, there's like 18 or 19 categories of, of harmful things that, that people do. And we've basically built AI systems to try to go identify what those things are that people are doing and try to make sure that that you know, doesn't happen on our network as much as possible. So um, yeah, I think you, you can, over time, I think you'll be able to break down um, this into more of a taxonomy too. And I, I think it's, it, this is a thing that we spend time researching too, because we want to make sure that we understand that. Uh, extremely well said. There's a lot of points to um, go in there. I'll start with one. We saw this with Sam Altman last year, where he was saying that, you know, some, you know, before humanity used to look at themselves and say Earth was the center of the universe, and now it revolves around the sun. Now it's a big, a big blow for a lot of folks, and you know, people, modern humans like scoff at that. And then now they turn around and they're very insecure now that these machines, these LLMs, are doing well on multitude of different standardized testing and over time they're getting better and better at different things and people are becoming very insecure 
And it is no different than the same insecurity. People felt that the earth is no longer the center of the universe. And so people need to adjust and, you know, re reset their egos and what they find their self, their, their self-worth and their pride in. And one thing I was telling Joe is, uh, we were listening to one of Dave Shapiro's videos where he was talking about the depression it would cause if this happens to him and he prides himself on his intelligence, but it's like, this is, that's not how humans have operated on this planet for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, a lot of people value themselves on their kinship ties and the relationships and the, um, the personal value that they add to the community and how they're helping in some form. And value doesn't mean that I have a job and I'm working somewhere. That means maybe you can just be here helping someone, you're doing something, you're creating art, you're helping people in the community and, and whatnot. So I thought that was interesting, interesting how he put that. The second thing he was mentioning, yeah, it's impossible for us to see before we launch a new technology, all the ways it could possibly go wrong. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't launch the technology. It just means that we should, you know, be cautious where we can, but still launch it so we can learn and iterate. And it, th I mean, if you follow what the um, folks want from the uh, AI alignment, AI ethicist community that made it so that Lambda and other things ever um, were released, and we know what Dave Chappelle thinks of those folks. First of all, they're lazy, good for nothing tricksters, crack smoking swindlers, and they stink. Yes, Dave, you're right about that. They want it, they want to do this thing called bear caging where basically they build their um, their career off of I stopped X, Y, and Z launched and, and made sure this launch didn't happen until it fits some random guidelines no one cares about and the product's useless and crap. Or someone else just goes to a different company and releases it. And then the CEO comes back to me and says, stop bear caging, which is basically what happened at Google when ChatGPT was launched. And it's impossible when these people are letting their imaginations run wild what could go wrong to ever beat that imagination unless you actually put something out there and say, like, see, you just are a crackpot. Or the thing that you thought was a big risk was just completely was minimal. Didn't even doesn't even matter. We've already fixed it already. And so OpenAI's ethos and Facebook's ethos has been iterative deployment of we can only we can only know there's there's as, as, as uh, Rumsfeld says, like, there's known knowns and there's known unknowns and there's unknown unknowns. And so it's the unknown unknowns that get you in trouble. And these AI ethicists try to act like they can think of all the unknown unknowns, but you can only know that until you actually ship something. Thank you, Don Rumsfeld. Shout out, even though you're, I don't agree with your politics. So um, that was interesting that he brought that up and all the fear mongering that's going on in the alignment community. And so let's go to the last clip. This clip is about um, the most important resource the company has. Most companies, it's um, it's obviously at least it's focus, right? It's like when you're a startup, maybe you're more constrained on capital. Um, you know, you, you just are working on one idea, and you you might not have all the resources. I think you cross some threshold at some point where the nature of what you're doing, you, you're building multiple things, and you're creating more value across them, but you become more constrained on what can you direct and to go well, and like. There's always the cases where something just random awesome happens in the organization. I don't even know about it. And those are, that's great. But like, but I think in general, the organization's capacity is largely limited by what like the CEO and the, and the management team are able to kind of oversee and, and kind of manage. It's, I, I think that that's just been a, a big focus for us. It's like, all right, keep the, as, as I guess Ben Horowitz says, keep the main thing, the main thing. Yep, that was a really good point. There's a Stanford professor. His name is Jeremy Pfeiffer, and he was um, – let's see here. Jeremy Pfeiffer, Stanford. Yeah, so he was making stories about like how all these companies – shouldn't be doing layoffs and this is all imitation and blah 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 and you know it's just stupid and it's a waste of time but he's coming from a point of view as being an academic who hasn't run an organization with 150,000 employees yes um there probably is a better way to apply these employees and no we're not pushing for layoffs and thinking that layoffs should happen we think it's terrible and companies over hire it destroys families creates depression creates issues and we're not for it but there is the aspect of it's not just the balance sheet. It's all those people are things or people that managers and then the CEO has to worry about those managers and those people about what to do, what projects to apply them on. And this is taking away final time from their attention and focus. And it's impossible to keep track of all these different things. And so then you have to start delegating a lot of decisions. And then it, you, 
you create a Google scenario where you're just launching all these different random projects and products with no real follow through that doesn't really align with like what your core interests are for your company. And eventually you have to start calling those projects and then you get a reputation of you're constantly killing things. And so you also look at uh, someone like Elon Musk, who's trying to get himself involved in everything possible from um, rocketry to then electric cars, to uh, uh, electric uh, uh, um, trucks, to then uh, robots, to then AI, to then uh, Neuralink, to then the boring machine, to going to Mars, to then doing space satellites. And everyone could say, oh, well, you know, he has other people working under him. Yes, but here's the thing. All those different areas and categories all have weird, unique situations that need to go on someone's desk, and it usually goes on his desk. And then he has to decide like what to do. And also he has Twitter too. So there's all this stuff coming at him. It's impossible to make good decisions consistently on all of those all of those things. Eventually you're going to face a situation where you can't keep juggling all those priorities and you're going to lose in some form. Um, and that's why I think Sundar is at a strategic disadvantage right now and Elon's at a disadvantage because uh, – you have Sam Altman who can just keenly focus in on working on AI and building the best models and getting it out there. And then you have Satya who can work on getting those models into enterprise customers' hands. Um, and then you have Sundar who is trying to juggle both of that, which is like super tough. But then at the same time, now you have Sam encroaching on internet search with having open AI, being able to search the internet for information. So now he's, it's, like a, it's a tag team, but he's getting attacked in different directions. And then Elon's dealing with the same thing, getting attacked by those two. But then also he has, there's Boston Dynamics, which is creating their own robots, and they're attacking the Optimus robot. And then you also have BYD, and then all the other car makers making other cars are attacking what they're doing. And then so it just becomes too confusing. So having smaller organizations and having your priorities set in a slower headcount just makes it easy for companies to get really good and efficient at a core area of work so they can actually build something and bring something to market that people actually enjoy and want to use. This also reminds me of a story I've heard from Zuck where he would say something in a meeting and employees would think, oh, he really means we should go pursue that. So they would go and form like a sprint team and because every, once your company becomes super hierarchical, the middle management is always afraid of looking bad in front of the VPs or whatnot. So if Zuckerberg said something, the middle management would take it on. And then people at the bottom <laughs> rung might say, like, why are we doing this? It makes no sense. And they say, well, Zuck said in the meeting that we should do X, Y, Z. So anyways, people are doing this, but they're not allowed to go to Zuck and say, should we still do this because the middle managers don't look stupid? So they work on this project, they get going, and then eventually the middle managers bring it to Zuck. And Zuck's like, oh, I was just, just thinking out loud. I didn't really think you should work on this. And I heard Stuart from Slack, he, he, uh, when, I, when he did his on, uh, uh, new hire orientation, he had a similar story like that happened to him at Slack. And so that's what happens the larger you get to. You have these communication errors because there's just so, so many people to manage and just way that world travels and how people are touchy about bringing in the CEO on certain things because they're worried the CEO has a little time, which they do. They have a little time. But if you have a CEO with a smaller organization, they'll be able to actually get engaged in some of those things and say, oh, yeah, sorry, that was stupid. Don't follow us saying there. I was smoking crack. Okay, so let's go to our next topic. Um, I'm now going to try to see if I can bring up a book every one or, one or two weeks that I think is really good. And my book on my list is Tao Che Ching. I have a reading list that um, anyone who is a supporter on our uh, support is channel member on YouTube or Patreon supporter gets access to. And I try to add a book or two, a book or two every one or two weeks. So let's start with the Tao Che Ching. So it's like a philosophy book, um, and uh, this was really, really fantastic book. And I read it a few times. And I'm not going to go over the history because I forget the history. Yeah, yeesh. But here are some passages I want to share with you. True virtue, true virtue makes no show of uh, virtue, and therefore it is really virtuous. False virtue never loses sight of itself and therefore it is no longer virtue. True virtue does not assert itself, and therefore it's unpretentious. False virtue is acting a part, and thereby is only pre pretense. When the Tao is lost, there is only virtue. When the virtue is lost, there is only generosity. When generosity is lost, there is only justice. And when justice is lost, only tradition remains. 
Tradition reduces loyalty and good faith to a shadow. It is the beginning of disorder. Tradition is the mere flower of the Tao. Apart from its root, it withers and dies. The truly great embody the spirit, not just the external experience. They bear fruit, not just blossoms. They do not put on a show of virtue. They practice it. And I, I think that was that really stuck with me because I you'll see a lot of folks who will do charities acts or acts of charity, but then they more do it and they then have to share, tell everyone that they've done it as a way to stroke their ego. And hey, I'm glad that they helped with charity or whatnot. But then it, part of you wonders, like, did you really do this for the sake of charity or are you just doing this to make yourself look good, which is always kind of weird. Um, and there's also in the Bible, I'm not going to start prophetizing people, but G Jesus has this quote that says, um, he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who is humbled will be exalted. Um, or he who, <laughs> he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who is humble will be exalted. And that always stuck with me uh, because you'll just see people who like to brag a lot about themselves and eventually someone just checks them and checks their ego and it's really sad and it goes to the whole thing of pride before the fall. And then I've noticed a lot of people who are just salt of the earth, hard workers who do really good work and eventually people just can't stop talking about all their great work and what they do. Here's another one on good government, but this also applies to large organizations. The government is best administered with virtue the army is best directed with strategy. The people are best ruled by giving them freedom. How do I know this is so? By the Tao. The more restrictions are enacted, the poorer the people become. The more soldiers patrol the streets, the more disorderly the city becomes. The more officials are crafty and cunning, the harder the people are to control. The more laws and orders are issued, the more thieves and robbers abound. The wise ruler, rule, the wise ruler says, if I practice restraint, the people will reform themselves. If I love peace, the people will become peaceful. If I'm not greedy, the people will become prosperous. If I practice simplicity, the people will remain simple. Short but profound. Um, I see this apply in large organizations where the end game of large organizations is everyone becomes Catholic, full of guilt because you're always breaking some process and you're always seeking for forgiveness. Uh, I saw that happen at Google. When I went, when I was at there, thirty three thousand. Like I, I was fresh out of college. I didn't know anything different. I worked at a small, small machine shop, but I didn't really feel like I felt like our HR team was relatively self contained while we worked. But then we went to one hundred eighty seven thousand folks. So I was like, oh, this is like, you know, five and a half x what I originally had, and um, this is just yikes. Uh, I can't get anything done. And then I went to Slack, and all of a sudden it was weird. It was like, oh, wait a minute. I was talking to a VP and I said, hey, I think for M&A, we should do X, Y, and Z, and here are some policy prescriptions. And she looked at me and she's like, okay, great, get it done. And I was like, what? <laughs> I have power to do stuff here? And you're not chastising me for having an idea? Uh, how, like at Google, how dare you have an idea here? That's, that's the idea department. Or how dare you say there's a problem here? That's the problem department to be bringing that up. And then when I went back to Salesforce, that same bureaucracy came back again. And so when you create so many rules and laws and processes, everyone becomes an offender. Everyone's fearful. Everyone's fearful of losing their job. And that's the issue. Like you'll get a new executive that comes in and goes, oh, we need to like break the bureaucracy. And here's a Slack channel. And we'll talk about breaking the bureaucracy. And this is what we're going to do. And, and, and it's predicated on the employees and have to take the risk of, okay, we're going to challenge the bureaucracy. But then we know that our performance reviews are based upon kumbaya and everyone liking us. So what if we break prior to the bureaucracy with that person then writes a negative performance review and hurts my promotion? Or what if that person's actually in promo committee and says something bad about me and hurts my promotion that way? Hmm, I'm not going to break this bureaucracy on my career. It's going to be your responsibility to do the real work of cleaning this bureaucracy up, not the, not the, the peasants. Okay, so let's go to another one. Um, submission. Okay, just this was written a long time ago. Everyone, so just go easy on me. A well-governed state is like a woman. Just as a woman, through cheerful and able service, wins control over a man, so a great state, by its peacefully generosity to smaller countries, wins their allegiance. And so a small state, by yielding to a great state, wins influence over it. Some submit to a conqueror, others conquer by submitting. Great states have no higher purpose than to form a federation and feed the people. Small states have no higher purpose than to enter a federation and serve the people. They have different ends, but achieve them. Both must practice submission. So when I used to do acquisitions, um, you know, most when I say mergers and acquisitions, most of the time it's acquisitions. Mergers assumes that you're on 
both companies are equal footing. Uh, acquisitions is basically here's a big dominant firm that has unlimited money, and then here's your small your business. You might have a good idea, but you can't take it anywhere further. So we're going to buy you out. Now, when that happens, the employees think, "Oh, like we're equal here, and we're they bought us because they like our products. So they're going to listen to what we're going to say, and they're going to take us seriously on this and that and this, and they're going to change their ways." But what no one really tells them is, or it's hard to tell them directly during the deal, is that no, actually. We now own you, and you have to submit to a jury. You have to f- comply with our wonky processes and how we do things. And that's why we gave you that oversized novelty check. That's why that equity that you, you when you started the company, it was a dollar a share, and now it's at 60 bucks a share. And now you're able to put your kid in a good school and get a mansion. That's why we're calling the shots. So that is something that people have to be always aware of. Like, where are you, where do you stand in the pecking order? You're never going to hear anyone say it in the company. Or say, oh, no, from the intern to the CEO, we're all equal. It's like, <laughs> no. Just wait until the company f- goes through troubled times. You'll see really who is who, who is equal, uh, who is more equal than others. So wherever you're at, always keep in the mind the pecking order and where you stand. And even if your company saying how great you are, always look out in the market and say, like, we're – if I was doing the same work somewhere else, how would I be treated? Maybe I'd be treated less than or more than, or maybe there's not this, so many opportunities in what I'm doing, and maybe I need to kick that chip off my shoulder and be more appreciative for what I have. You should always be aware of that pecking order. Um, let's see. Not knowing. Not to know the things you ought to know is folly. To know that there are some things you cannot know is wisdom. The wise recognize the limits of their knowledge. The foolish, the foolish think they know everything. This kind of applies to what I see going on with AI researchers. There are some, and it's not everyone. There are a lot. There's a good portion who are just like, hey, we don't really know exactly how certain aspects of these models work yet. We're figuring it out, but that's cool and that's okay. Let's still progress. And if we don't know, that's fine. We'll keep on learning things as we go, but we're releasing really good tech. And there's other ones who will say, mm, I don't know how something, something works and that really scares me. And oh, like, this could be Terminator. It's like, no, like the history of the society is we're kind of like on this island of understanding where things around things on the island, we know for certain how things work, like how gravity works and how electricity works and how um, cells split and divide, like mitosis, meiosis or something. Look, I barely got through biology in high school. And then when we start, we can start looking on out in the shore, and I guess people talk. I don't want to get into I'm not in physicist, but people talk about string theory. It's very hotly contested. But let's say like string theory is like off the island, but you can kind of see your binoculars. And then there's things that you can't even see with your binoculars, and that's where it just goes into just you know, we don't know. It, it's that's where we can fill the gaps with different philosophies or assumptions and things like that. And that's how science has been, and we're always trying to expand that island as time goes on, but. I'm sure the ancient greats during the Renaissance scientists, like, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and um, like Galileo and things like that. There's a lot of things they knew they, they didn't know how they worked, but they worked and they were okay with it. They didn't say, oh, like, uh, there must be a demon inside. It's going to kill us all. They kind of just adapted to it. So, all right. And, and the, the prophetizing, if you want the book, please use the affiliate link below. It, 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 supports our show or if you can't afford the book go to a library support your library they're fantastic so i think everyone has seen um recently uh the boston dynamics create a new robot and they had the launch video and we decided hey you know what the launch video music is it's not that good we need to sphicize it so we have uh kratos who's a member a member of our show and supporter and he decided to drop this banger. So we're going to close this episode with this awesome video here. Um, I hope you enjoy. What the hell? Oh! What? That rival! Rival! That boy rolls on the table! Let go! Rival! 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 I'm 
So that's how Boston Dynamics should have launched that bot. They had a really missed opportunity there. They've done good so far by they got Spot the Dog and they gave it a British accent and whatnot, and they had the bots dancing to Motown before, but they could have used that song. So hopefully if anyone hears from Boston Dynamics, please share that with them. Um, the Kratos, thank you for using that. That was from our private Discord. Uh, you can just become a supporter for two ninety nine or a show or, or higher, and you get access to it. Great content in there. I'm in there. A lot of great members are in there. Learnable. There's a lot of great members in there, but I happen to be in there, but I'm not a great member. I'm more of just a manager of Wendy's. Um, but people who – Wendy's is a great institution, and it's, it's good work. Anyways, um, don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing what you all have to say in the comment section and also in our private Discord. Talk to you all later. Peace.